Dear FMX community, welcome to the opening of Highlights of FMX 1994 to 220. With this live program, Film Academy's Animations Institute wants to bridge the time until we can all meet again in person by presenting outstanding speakers from the history of FMX to you. My name is Andreas Hukade. I'm director of Film Academy's Animations Institute, conference chair of FMX, and your host for this show. We're all happy you're joining us today. Uh, we have turned your microphones off to avoid background noise, but those of you who are with us in the interactive room, they can use the chat function on the lower right side of the screen to send in questions, and we'll do our best to pass them on to our interview guest. So, we are especially happy to start this series of talks with Dr. Jan Pinkava. Mr. Pinkava's career in animation spans a quarter of a century, including 13, 13 years as a director at Pixar, where he wrote and directed the cornerstone film Jerry's Game, receiving an Academy Award for it. He is also the creator and co director of Pixar's Ratatouille a film about a rat that wants to become a chef that opened the hearts of millions of children and grown-ups all around the globe. Jan Pinkawa was also the founder and creative director of the renowned Google Spotlight Stories project, a team of artists and technologists working with leading directors and studios that define new forms of immersive, interactive storytelling for film, mobile, and VR. So you see, he's a pioneer in many fields. We are so happy he is here with us. Welcome, Dr. Jan Pinkava. Hello, everybody. It's such a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. And thank you, Jan, to join your time uh, uh, with us. And I'd like to start with a simple yet very important question. How are you doing at the moment? Andreas, thank you. That's a, that's a very generous question to ask, and I know you mean it sincerely. I'm doing uh, almost too well. Uh, everything is well with me and my family here in Portland, Oregon, where I live. Uh, we have a forest nearby to walk in. Our town and our community has not been hard hit by the virus, and so all is well. But I think like all of you underneath, of course, I have the same anxiety, the same worries, and very interesting dreams. Uh, do you have, uh, uh, which, uh, which effect do you think does uh, the virus have on, on the community where you live at the moment? People are anxious to get back to a life that is a different new normal. I think uh, the initial uh, handling of the crisis is something that we can all rise to. But then coping with a different world is something else. That is where everyone is trying to balance their responsibilities to the community and their own, especially American, sense of freedom uh, to uh, do what they want. This is the tension in our society that is playing out now. Yes, we will not elaborate on the tensions of society. We want to elaborate on you and your path, your artistic path, your path as a, uh, a technician. And we prepared a little film with talks and interviews you gave in the past at FMX and at Film Academy. And we'd like to show this to our audience and use it as a starting point for our conversation. Okay? So here is Spotlight on Jan Pinkava. Uh, when I was a little boy, I used to steal chocolate from my mother's pantry. And there was a scene in our living room in our house where my mother was confronting me and accusing me of stealing her chocolate. And I looked my mother in the eye and I said, no, it wasn't me. Intentionally crossing the line in my mother's face was somehow very memorable and I thought it was like magic and this story is based on a little boy who 
I'm not going to tell you the whole story, but he has to lie to his mother. He wants a dog, and he steals the Thanksgiving turkey leg, and, he's, and she's accusing him, and he blames the dog that doesn't exist, and suddenly, the dog is there. It exists. He conjures it into being with his lie. And it becomes his friend, and it grows, and grows, and grows, and grows, like Otesanek. I uh, have a, a background that's a little bit of a weird mix, personally, between technology and art. I began as an animator, I turned into a technologist, I went back to animation, and back and forth and back and forth, and I was always encouraged in my background to, to be interested in everything. Young talents are important for the world, not the industry. Uh, we, uh, <laughs> because it's the future. Uh, and so we have to all do our best to help young people uh, find what they, what they can do best. Uh, it's better for everybody if people are working to the best of their ability at something they should be doing. Maybe we're actually living through right now the golden age of animated shorts. If you are able to reach out across the web and gather up all the short animations that are out there now, Somewhere in there, I guarantee there's gold. There are pearls, there are works of genius. One of the things I always liked about uh, working in Pixar is there was this sense of commitment to the highest possible quality because it matters what you release. That ethic, that idea that you care about the movie you're making so much so that you're prepared to eat the costs of having to do restarts and delays and work that much harder. I think that's a great point of view. I think that's the right way to be. If we can experience uh, something that is moving or entertaining or fun or just something that is emotionally engaging in our busy days with this uh, phone in, uh, that we carry with us, that's, that's a great thing. Uh, I, I love the idea that we are reaching potentially anyone who has a phone in their pocket. The technology will always melt away. The techniques and methods will be just techniques and methods for something. And what will be left is stories and meaning and the, the underlying purpose of the piece or the, the, the work. And remembering that and knowing that that's the, the reason you're doing it, not as an experiment in method, but to learn how to use the method to do something worthwhile. I think all art, especially movies, does the following things to the audience. Number one, it changes uh, your status with respect to money. We need your money, otherwise there's no industry. We want your time. And time is what we feel we've lost when we see a bad movie. Um, but really, someone who is um, uh, a serious entertainer will want to do the third thing, which is to change your mood. Now, the filmmaker is also interested in changing your perspective, your point of view, giving you some new insight. And this is why Roger Ebert, long before um, Chris Milk and VR, called uh, movies the, uh, the machine for empathy. Right. It's, uh, it's to expand our moral uh, imagination, to give us an idea that we, we can see things from another point of view. And the great stuff actually affects you directly and lives inside you forever. That's the real art. Those are the classic movies that affect you personally and the culture. Yes, Jan. Uh, we just saw it in the clip when you held your speech at the opening at Film Academy 218. You electrified our students and our colleagues with a confession of having lied to your mother when you were a boy. I think the reason we were all electrified is that we all have lied to our mothers when we were children. So you created a strong invisible bond between you, the narrator, and us, the audience. So can you talk about this invisible bond between storytellers and audience? And can you specify on how you create this invisible bond with the audience? Yes, th thank you, Andres. This is it, the, 
the sense of uh, something we believe. Uh, you made me cry almost with, with that clip again. When I remember that time, I felt uh, making a story out of that experience, I felt lucky to remember something very personal. And I think the best work has uh, a sense of the universal in the specific. So your own experience, your own human experience, uh, specifically yours, is an aspect of everybody's experience. We're all human. And so we respond to a story about real human experience, something based on actual emotional life that we all share. And that, I think, is a basis for that connection between the filmmaker and the audience. And it's a very fragile connection. It's a very tentative um, uh, uh, deal that we're making. If I'm the filmmaker, you're giving me your time, you, the audience, and I owe you something. I owe you my best work. I owe you my honesty. I owe you something that is consistent and entertaining, something that will gather your attention and will reward you for spending time with me or my ideas. And do you as an artist have like specific tools uh, to craft that bond? Or let me put it another way, uh, when do you know you're ready? And is that bond an importance for you to start a project? Uh, no, I don't know if I'm ready. Uh, it's a, uh, filmmaking is a craft. Uh, you try to learn all the techniques and methods for uh, presenting the ideas, the feelings uh, that you want. Um, and I don't, um, I, I don't have any magic solution or any, any, any surefire technique, of course. Uh, but it's very important, I think, to respect the audience. This I've heard many times in my career. Uh, if you don't respect the audience, you may, you are likely <clears throat> to go astray. And this idea that the audience that you are making your work for is you, that some of the best artists make their work for themselves, not as a self-indulgence, but to to make something for someone they respect as much as themselves. So that's a way to help you think, would I like this? Uh, will the audience benefit from this? If this was shown to me, would I respect it? Would I respond to it? Would I feel something? That's your first thing. But always remember that you're making something for an audience. That's what the movies are. Okay, so let's try to respect our audience. We just got a question from one Paolo Scatena, and uh, it involves, a, it's a question about storytelling. So Paolo writes, storytelling is less and less limited to the beginning, middle, and end model. Boundaries are blurred, our attention span changed. However, science shows that we value the memory of an experience more than the experience itself and that we are heavily biased by how it ends. With this fluidity in the format, how do you see the challenges of delivering a powerful, memorable experience? Actually, that's a great question because we live in the time when, when we're talking a lot about so-called non-linear storytelling. And this is influenced by the convergence of uh, movies and games and so on. And um, uh, perhaps one of the things Paolo is referring to uh, Thank you, Paolo, is uh, Daniel Canahan's Thinking Fast and Slow. It's a, a popular book that details this idea that it, all of us, in a way, are um, story makers. We deal with our experience, and when we remember what happened to us, we remember the most emotional thing that happened to us and how it all ends, which, if you think about it, is the es essence of a story. Endings are so important. Um, and we have to think about uh, the experience of the audience in a nonlinear story uh, situation. Okay, uh, there are different possibilities. They, make, they can go this way or that way, but it's the responsibility of the filmmaker or the creator of the experience 
to make sure that all the different routes that the audience can take through their maze of possibilities are worthwhile. Don't give the audience an opportunity to waste their time. Don't give the audience bad experiences. Try and make it all good. In the end, we're all of us stuck in time and our real experience is linear. Someone once said, uh, life is one damn thing after another. And that is how we experience all the non-linearity of these complex stories, one thing at a time. And so in the end, it's still a linear experience. Remember that. You, you, all, uh, you also said uh, on one of our, your visits here, uh, you elaborated about growing up as a child behind, uh, quote, the Iron Curtain and how artists moved into children's entertainment because they could find some freedom of, of expression there. Can you elaborate on the impact this had to you as a child? I was born in Czechoslovakia, in Prague. And my family came to the UK in 1968 after the Soviet invasion, and I grew up in the so-called free world. And I was always very aware through my family about this difference between the Iron Curtain, the East and the West. Um, in my old country, back then, in the bad old days of communism, um, there was, of course, a great deal of censorship, a totalitarian state. And uh, it so happened at that time that uh, if you were an artist, of course, you had to have the uh, permission of the state. But a lot of the good artists who um, didn't want to be in the spotlight, in the center, under the censorship of the state, did work at the edges where perhaps the authorities were less um, keen to look. And that was often um, in things like children's books. One of my great influences and heroes is uh, Yuri Trinka, a children's book illustrator primarily, a great filmmaker. But he and others, a handful, a handful of people who were allowed to work by the state in that area, illustrated hundreds of children's books. And because they were trying to do their work outside as much as possible of the spotlight of these censors and authorities, we found suddenly that, and I only noticed this in retrospect when I look back as an adult, we had the best artists, the best artists in our country working to illustrate our books for the children, as it were, thinking of the future generation. And so I was incredibly lucky, incredibly lucky as a side effect of the bad politics to be exposed to beautiful work, to great influences aesthetically, uh, that uh, that formed me for the rest of my life. I'm very grateful for that. So if you compare the situation of the artists behind the Iron Curtain way back to the situation of the artists working in, quote, the free world now, where do you see the similarities and where do you see the differences? That's a very subtle question, Andreas, actually. Uh, it is to me uh, about what we do with freedom. Uh, it's, I guess, one of my obsessions, freedom and censorship. Uh, in a, in a uh, authoritarian state, you have the government telling you what to do. And in the free world, you have to make a living in working for a corporation or trying to make your own company and uh, out in the world. Perhaps the difference is that uh, when you're under the thumb of an authoritarian state, uh, you are being censored. And when you're trying to make your living in the free world, you are censoring yourself perhaps to make sure that you keep your job and to make sure that you are uh, going to have a career uh, because there's no one looking after you. Uh, so perhaps uh, there's a sense there, as I think uh, George Bernard Shaw said about freedom, that uh, freedom means responsibility. And that's why men fear it, people fear it. So in the, not free world, you're struggling, I think, really it boils down to you're struggling to be decent because the situation you're in is not decent. And in the free world or in a freer world, you're choosing to be decent, choosing to do things that you believe in, even when they maybe rub against the 
the need to make a living. There's always a tension of some kind. Does there have to be a tension to create great art? I like pushback, don't you? Don't you? Uh, you know, some, some, I think uh, I've had the best situations where there's some friction, some, something to push against, something to make your muscles grow, something that you have to make an effort and to test yourself to see, do I really believe this? Is this really what I mean to do? Uh, do I really know what I'm talking about? Do I have the right idea? It does this work? Um, one of the terrible fears of serious artists is to be totally free and to be left alone and to be given anything you want. That's a great, <laughs> that's a great way. <laughs> to be unlimited is a disaster. <laughs> But you, but you, you did not craft your your work all by yourself in your uh, professional career. You always worked uh, with a team of highly qualified artists and technicians. Uh, so, can you elaborate on how, why, and when the team comes in, and how do you cast the team? Ah. Uh, the, uh, the, all these are fundamental questions. Yeah, really, really hard. Um, I've been lucky enough to do interesting new things, a lot of um, innovative things for which you always need to work with other people. Um, things don't come uh, to you in, your, in a way that you can do by yourself. It doesn't work that way. So when you're doing new things, you're working with other people. And, um, and you want to be working in a team that solves the problems and that the team makes it better, whatever it is you're doing. That's why you work with, 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 with other people. And you have to, if you're doing anything significant, you have to make a, a collaborative effort to scale up all that effort so that really in a good team, the whole is bigger than the sum of its parts. Everyone is contributing and working on each other's strengths and weaknesses so that together you're making something much bigger than you can do individually. That's what you want, of course. All that is easy to say. But everyone must realize they're helping to uh, realize a single purpose uh, that is often given by the vision of a director or something like that. And so then the question is how to cast people, how to, how to put, get the team together. Um, you have to work with the right people. In Hollywood, people, uh, as soon as you work with someone you like that you can communicate with, that you do good work with, People hold on to them, you know, oh my God, I, I need to work with you again. One of the best um, uh, compliments that you can give someone in the film industry is to say, I would work with you again. So how do you, how do you find who to work with? Um, well, uh, the first thing is look at their past work. Uh, by their fruit, you shall know them. Yes. Uh, so look at, that's what showreels are for. That's how you, uh, you, you look at what you've done. And if you don't have that, uh, you look at reputation and recommendation. You hope people you trust and uh, what, what do we know about people? And then if you don't have that, you look at uh, motivation and work ethic. Do they want, are they young people who want to work? Perhaps they haven't had a, a great opportunity yet to do a, a mass, a great deal of work for you to, to, to assess them. So how, how, how uh, motivated are they? But uh, I'll never forget, uh, I think it was Ed Catmull who first said to me, and I've heard this many times, you should uh, try and work with people who are better than you. Yes, uh, there's a, a question coming in from our friend Ian Fails, and it's connected to what you just said. And he asks, the subdiff developments made on Jerry's game are still at the forefront of many CG artists' minds today. What do you remember back then about the development of, of subdivision surfaces for the film? And probably, Jan, you could explain for our audience what subdivision surfaces are. Uh, yes, well, I'll try. This is a technical question. Uh, subdivision surfaces are a way of uh, specifying, creating, defining uh, all the shapes in, in a 3D computer graphic world. 
especially useful for organic shapes like faces and hands and the pieces that make up characters. Um, back when we were doing Jerry's Game a lifetime ago, 25 years ago, uh, it, most things were stitched together in the computer out of things called NURBS, non-uniform rational B splines. Look it up. Um, but what those were were really kind of mathematical squares of rubber that you had to make everything out of squares of rubber. And uh, sometimes those didn't come together properly at corners and edges. And uh, certainly at Pixar back then, we had trouble making some of the characters for the films out of pieces of square rubber. And um, there was a uh, technique called subdivision surfaces, actually that Ed Catmull invented when he was a student at Brigham Young University in Utah, that was brought back again uh, by Tony DeRose, one of the um, researchers working on Jerry's Game. Um, and uh, it was a technique that, when it was first invented, was too hard on the computer. The computers weren't strong enough, serious enough back then. And uh, by the time Tony came uh, back with uh, subdivision surfaces, a new implementation, uh, uh, it was possible to, to run these on the machines we had. And we created uh, the uh, geometry uh, for Jerry's game uh, using subdivision surfaces and some new techniques. And it rapidly became very, very useful because it was the means by which we could get a complex, organic behavior and shape uh, in, the, in especially Jerry's face. And uh, now it's everywhere all the time. You, um, it's standard everywhere. Um, it's a intuitively simple and technically powerful way of uh, creating um, surfaces in computer graphics. Did you envision uh, the film Jerry's Game in your head uh, before it's been executed, or was it? Uh, did it come to bloom while it's uh, uh, while it's been made? The latter. Uh, uh, I had uh, an idea of the 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 main sense of it. It was inspired by my grandfather, who played chess with himself, which is something that always uh, amused me and amazed me that he could do that. Very determined man. And um, I actually pitched the first version of Jerry's Game to uh, John Lasseter and the others at Pixar, and it was really terrible. Uh, and uh, they were very uh, reasonable and decent and said, um, start again. Uh, and so I did. And, I, and it was a work of development. And so working, reboarding, storyboarding. But the essence of the piece, which is one person, one character, this old man, playing chess with himself and and becoming two characters. That was, of course, there from the beginning. That's the nature of the story. And um, there were things about it that always um, amused me. I, I, I liked certain moments which were there from the beginning and, and survived to the very end. But it developed, it changed. It, uh, it hopefully got better than it was. You also talked about your fascination for the art of animation and especially for independent animation. Uh, can you elaborate on this fascination? And do you foresee a future for this art form? And if yes, where and how? Yeah, this is one of the big questions. Uh, for all of us who love especially short animation, and I do, I think I've said this many times, animated short films are like the poetry of the movie business. Um, they are the individual voices of the artists. You can make a short film on a small budget. You can make a short film on a big budget. Uh, but you can make an expressive, meaningful, serious, beautiful, funny, amusing piece of work. And a short film can, uh, like, a po like a poem, um, be anything from a, something trivial to uh, something that's profound, uh, a deathless verse. Okay, so I think we're actually, uh, we are in the golden age of short films. The barrier to entry technically to make them is way down. We have the means of production. We can, we can make films. Uh, the question is how to survive if you want to be a short film maker. Um, and I think experience shows that it's possible but difficult. Uh, is there a future for the art form? 
uh, yes, uh, artists will always be here to uh, want to do it. Uh, there is a present and a future and a past, but if, there is of course a future because people will keep doing it. Uh, filmmakers, poets, artists are arrogant people who think they have something to say that people should hear. <laughs> And uh, and so they they can't stop themselves. The in the digital age we have the tools. The internet is the web is the the means to get to our audience. But of course, on the other side, it's this giant flat bazaar where we have to shout to be seen to get noticed. Um, but there is the the means to reach whatever niche audience that you want to reach it's there uh you you have to find it and perhaps technology uh, could help us i mean uh, here at film academies animations institute we have a research and development department for example and they're working on the tools of tomorrow and it always blows my mind what's possible and what will be possible it looks to me like finally we will be even more liberated from the redundancies of the past and be able to expand our art. So do you see any chances that can that can that technology can liberate our art form? And if yes, how? Um, uh, I've worked with technology all my life. I made the case uh, when I spoke at FMX uh, that art and technology are cousins, they're, they're, they're connected. Uh, artists have always used technology. Uh, I'm sorry to sound so philosophical. I, I feel almost embarrassed at my wisdom. <laughs> but uh, technology really is an amplifier of human effort, isn't it? Uh, we, we use technology to do something that's complex or difficult that we couldn't do just with uh, without the technology. It's it's there to to increase the output of our effort, which is great. But one thing you must hold on to when using technology, and we've seen this in computer graphics, uh, in, in all kinds of things, the intent of what you want to do. You have an idea, a feeling, something you want to make. And it's very important that the technology enables you to do it and doesn't dissuade you or uh, misdirect you or um, kick you off in another direction because the technology, as complex as it is, is very persuasive, very difficult to drive. It's very, um, it has its own grooves and its own uh, strengths. And the best work using technology is there to is amplified by the technology and not um, uh, and not uh, shifted by it. You have to force the technology to do what you want it to do. And of course, with every medium, every technique that you use, um, you learn from it. And there's a there's a, 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 a play back and forth between the artist and the technique. And you and you you create something that is the technique is good for. Uh, but uh, there are, uh, it, it's always important to, to use the technology for your purpose, uh, not let the technology drive. So that almost answers the next question, which would be, do you see any dangers of modern technology, uh, especially for the artists? And is there a danger we'd lose something on the way? And if yes, what? What can it be? What, was, what do you think we should care for not to lose in the process? There is a danger. I'm, I'm terribly nervous and anxious and neurotic about technology. I think that we have everything to lose. It's possible for us <clears throat> as people, <coughs> excuse me, to feel small when connected to the vast web of, uh, of the world and, and the technology that we use, and to be hugely impressed and affected by the technological uh, things that we're, we experience. And uh, the dangers are ones of systems overtaking our humanity. That's a, <laughs> that's a big thing to say. 
Can you elaborate? Mm, it's a cybernetic question. Uh, even uh, Norbert Wiener, who invented the term cybernetics in 1948, I think, um, he was concerned with how people can use technology. Uh, we want to be not trapped inside a system. We want our systems to serve our human needs and our aims and our humanity. Our, uh, our people, people are people. We want to stay people, not uh, adjuncts, uh, peripheral devices to a machine age. Futureologists and science fiction writers have for so long been talking about the time when the robots take over. It's a very seductive idea. Uh, perhaps it will happen, I don't know. Uh, but for now, let's uh, fight for the people. Yes, and we can still have a walk in the woods, couldn't we? It's the best thing. I'm so lucky here to be uh, a few steps away from a very large park uh, of woodland here in Portland, Oregon, and uh, it uh, heals the soul. Yeah, we have here another uh, question coming in from A. Punkt, writing on Instagram, and he asks you, what was your most challenging job so far? Good question. Um, I think perhaps the most challenging job in my recent memory, I guess, if so many years ago now, is uh, the beginning of uh, Google Spotlight Stories, when we were making our first production. Uh, a small team, uh, friends, colleagues uh, from many different disciplines, from uh, games and uh, mobile phone technology and uh, uh, engineers and uh, friends from the film industry. And we were creating something new and we were doing it by doing. That's the way you learn. You do something and see how it goes. And we were creating a production called uh, Windy Day about uh, a mouse who finds a hat. It's an allegory of desire in the woods. It's a, it's a, I, I love the story. Uh, it was created with my friends Mark Ofterdahl and Doug Sweetland. And it was a challenge in every dimension, uh, uh, personally, politically, technologically. Uh, and there were many times uh, in the production and the effort to create this new form that it was on the brink of failure. It was about to fall apart for various reasons. And when I look back, uh, I realize that the reason it didn't fall apart, the reason that we were able to succeed in making something and to move forward was simply the desire to do it, to not give in to the challenge, to meet the, uh, the difficulty and to figure out a way. And that was both extremely difficult and extremely rewarding to put that effort in to fix problems you didn't know how to fix and see uh, and intend to win, to, to, to get through it, to find some way to solve the problem. Uh, I, that perhaps was the most challenging recently. Jan, you've got a problem here because the more you talk, the more questions come in here. And there's our friend Adam Finkelstein. He asked, Jan, would you please comment on the nature of abstraction in film versus the nature of abstraction in virtual, uh, in brackets, 3D worlds? Ah, uh, thank you, Adam. That's, uh, that's another complex question. Again, I wish we were um, able to talk about it personally over a beer. Uh, when uh, that's, I'm embarrassed to talk about uh, art and abstraction, things like this. Um, abstraction is boiling down essentials. It's taking from the, the rich chaos of reality and showing only some things, some aspects of our perception. And um, I don't see a fundamental difference between abstraction styling, if that's what you mean, in the movies and in uh, digital media like virtual reality. Um, I remember uh, going back to Jerry's game at Pixar all those years ago, there was a, a very, very um, earnest debate, which in some ways is still happening today, about how to portray human characters in three-dimensional computer graphics. And uh, at the time, there were still many people, as there are today, 
who wanted to create um, synthetic humans, synthespians, they called them. Uh, and uh, it's, a, it's a push now in real-time graphics to make realistic humans. We all have that uh, Frankenstein instinct in us. We want to control. Um, but, and cartoons are abstractions. And uh, they, are, um, they are versions of, uh, they are artful versions of reality. And I remember bringing my background and experience of puppetry uh, from my home country of Czechoslovakia and the work of Jiří Trnka and so on to say, well, the best way here is to abstract and create uh, stylized human beings. And that's where we made Jerry's Game as an example of how to stylize, to draw on the rich history of stylization in portraying human characters as puppets. Um, I think all those things are still true. It's about our perception of the world, whatever the medium, whatever the technology, uh, how do you um, create an impactful and strong image that um, is memorable and uh, serves the purpose of, of, the, of the story that you're telling? I don't see a difference. Mm. It stays philosophical. Uh, Johannes Wolters writes a question. He says, for everything to stay the same, everything must change. How do you deal with change? And is paradise something in an imaginary past or in a distant future? We, we really do need to be in the pub with a beer here, don't we? Uh, uh, plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose. Uh, what, what everything must change. I, well, of course, increasingly I deal with change uh, with greater and greater difficulty as I get older. Uh, as as I, I gain more barnacles on the bottom of my boat, it's harder to move forward. But um, I think change is good. Uh, sorry to give you this banal reply, but uh, the the changes that happen around us in and how we communicate, how we uh, how we deal with life's difficulties, how we uh, how we uh, entertain each other, and so on those will hopefully continue and they're, they're stimulating, they're, they're, they're interesting, they're fun, they're, they move us, they, they keep us moving forward. Something doesn't change. I, I'm not able to keep up with the rate of technological change. Uh, I'm not a kid anymore, so I'm not excited by uh, the technology itself and its potential for power. I'm excited by how we can use new things to um, to reach out to each other more. And uh, there are, I, I'm more and more aware of the things that don't change, the invariants, the things that are constant, and the things that I'd like to be constant. Um, and uh, I think I need to reach for a cup of tea uh, in lieu of some booze here excuse me very good you can have your sip of tea and i'll read out the next question from isabel brown to you uh, she's interested as you were talking about boundaries as something that brings out your creativity what sort of freedom and boundaries do you wish for you and your team and when is the time you wish for what and when is the time you wish for one or the other? I have to confess, I don't understand the question. And when is the time you wish for one or the other? Yes, yeah, now I see it. Freedom and freedom. boundaries. Uh, is that what you mean, Isabel? about? Freedom and boundaries. Uh, yeah. um, as, as, uh, as I said again, I think that uh, uh, total freedom is a trap. Uh, it's the worst thing to be... Um, uh, let's see, let's think of something terribly philosophical. Ah, uh, of course, the great quote from Archimedes, give me a place to stand and I can move the world on the principle of the lever, right? You need a place to stand. You need something to push from. Uh, you need some a point of reference. If you're floating in total freedom, uh, it's really difficult to get anything done. So you constrain yourself. The best thing an artist can have is constraints. And artists 
work in formal ways in a particular form to create those constraints like um, uh, the language of Shakespeare iambic pentameter a constrained formal uh, poetic form so that as you push against that form you can uh, do more you can create something uh, really touching memorable uh, something that that uh, you can feel more strongly you want those constraints. You want to say, I'm going to make a film with uh, one black pencil and a piece of paper, and that's it. That is a constraint. And out of that constraint comes uh, imagination to say, how can I uh, uh, say, bring a feeling of what I want to say, communicate the, these basic ideas within this form? Um, and I think the best work is uh, constrained and limited and uh, we um, there's a lot to say about how uh, uh, the 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 formal constraints of a particular art form help it actually gain greater expressive power this is um, an important thing and it's not uh, as we strive for things like realism in um, uh, real-time graphics which is a, a laudable goal um, that realism is not going to make the work we do inherently more powerful. A lot of people think it will, but that's not why we as people, as audiences, respond, uh, feel something when we see a piece of work, not because it's real. Uh, I'm going to do it again. I'm going to quote Goethe. Art is art because it is not life. It is the abstraction the formal, um, the, the different version of the thing that allows you to say something strongly. Weird, isn't it? Yes. There's one more question from the audience, and it's an existential questions, question as well. Lily Muller writes, what for you is the essence of inspiration and creativity? Or what are the conditions to it? The conditions of inspiration and creativity. <laughs> A nice, hard deadline. <laughs> Thank you for this. One last question, Jan. Uh, our students, they had to they had to draw and describe their golden future. And so I'd like to ask you, how do you foresee your golden future? I there are lots of things I want to do. Uh, and in my golden future, uh, I would like to create a sculpture that uh, I will be happy for my sons to remember me by. Uh, and I want to help uh, many more films be made. And I want to enjoy time with people where I can say what I think is true. Uh, I think that will happen more and more, actually, as I get less and less worried about what will happen to me. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, I'm looking forward to doing a variety of different creative projects, different new things for me. Um, maybe um, modern dance, maybe um, something like that. So uh, I see uh, more interesting work ahead. That's my golden future. And I see the potential for a better future for us all as we uh, come uh, out of this time that's challenging for all of us and that we can hopefully uh, get something from as well as suffer within. Thank you so much, Jan, for this interview. We got a little surprise for you now. Uh, we picked a trailer from the history of FMX for you. And it's a trailer called Herbstglaub by Oliver Vogel. And 
it's not only about an existential hero, it's also the birth of the choir of Animations Institute who delivered the song for this uh, trailer. And uh, we'd like to show you this trailer now, we'd like to show it to the community. And the community has uh, the chance, the ones who are in the interactive room now, to activate their camera. So after the trailer, we can all say goodbye to each other for today and say goodbye to our speaker of the day, Jan Pinkava. But first, have fun now with Herbstlaub by Oliver Vogel. Genius. What a wonderful thing. Andreas, I can't hear you if you can hear me. future program uh, tomorrow we'll meet again at 6 p.m central european time when mario muller program manager of fmx is going to interview volker engel president of uncharted territory so stay healthy stay safe see you again tomorrow and goodbye <laughs>